Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much to everybody for joining us for the fifth and final day of the 17th Vermont Organics Recycling Summit, organized by the Composting Association of Vermont in partnership with the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. I'm Natasha Duarte, the director of the Composting Association of Vermont. The summit this year is being held as a kickoff event for International Compost Awareness Week, which starts on Sunday, May 7th. Uh, the International Compost Awareness Week is the largest and most comprehensive education initiative of the compost industry. The theme for this year that we also adopted is for healthier soil, healthier food, compost. And I'm just going to give one more shout out to the students at the University of Vermont in Dr. Deb Nair's composting ecology and management class. One of them created this poster here on the right for International Compost Awareness Week. It's something that they do every year. And if the full collection of posters is available on our website at compostingvermont.org slash VORS. And if you click on those images, you can read the story of the inspiration that the students had for creating their version of the ICAW posters. I'd also like to thank our fabulous sponsors without whom we would not be able to bring this content, uh, this full week program to you all free of charge. It's something really special that we hope to continue being able to do into the future as well. Our sponsors this year include Community Bank, Nature Cycle, Eco Products, Vegware, Addison County Solid Waste Management District, AgriLab Technologies, Vermont Natural Ag Products, the Vermont Produce Program from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and RMI, Building Healthy Soils. So huge thanks to them. Many of these folks are perennial sponsors, so we can count on their support. And, um, and it makes a huge difference for what we can bring to you all uh, during the program. So here we are today, Friday, May 5th, and we are at the Jumping Worms session. This has become an increasingly hot topic. Um, they are here. So what the heck do we do about it? We're gonna hear some great uh, information and share some resources out with you all today. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and invite Dan Goosen, who is the facilitator of the session to Take a, to start us off. Dan is on my board of directors, and he is also uh, in charge of the compost operation at CSWD's Organic Diversion Facility since 2008, and that is Green Mountain Compost, which no matter how many times Dan tells me, I think we're all just going to know it as Green Mountain Compost, but I'm trying. Um, before uh, CSWD Organics Diversion Facility, Dan got his start actually at the Intervale Compost in 2003. He spends a lot of time working with people and uh, a lot of time with people and working with numbers, but is happiest when he can still get back out and climb a mountain of compost and spend the day screening his piles. So thank you so much, Dan, for uh, organizing this panel, this session, and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. Thanks for uh, bringing jumping worms back into the forefront because it is a important topic that we hear about uh, seasonally more than sometimes more than others, but um, is growing in awareness. Yeah, I think Vermonters are growing in awareness and with that I have lots of questions. So uh, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing Joseph and Emily and then the way the rest of the session will work is that Joseph's going to give us a brief presentation on kind of an overview of jumping worms, where we're at, uh, what they are, um, and then I'll show a few slides of uh, kind of what we're doing at our facility um, to use as a case study for best, best management practices for compost and composters. Uh, and then the three of us will be joining together for a short panel discussion talking a little bit more about what jumping, the state of jumping worms in Vermont and what we're doing and what can be done. Um, and then we're gonna open up to questions because I know there will be questions. So without further ado, Joseph Gores is an associate professor of ecological soil management at UVM, uh, University of Vermont. His current research interests include earthworm invasions, composting, soil erosion and mitigation of nutrient pollution with mycophyto remediation. Uh, Joseph earned his PhD at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology and has an MS degree in Natural Resource Sciences from the University of Rhode Island. Emily, in a way, has been with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets for 17 years and has primarily spent her career serving
observing uh, invasive pests or invasive pests, insects and pathogens both. Um, and as the agency's plant health team lead, Emily works with the state entomologist, state survey co coordinator, and other state agencies, as well as UVM Extension, to implement statewide surveys and to provide outreach and education to the general public about these pest threats, including jumping works. So without further ado, Joseph, uh, if you want to start sharing your screen, he's going to walk us through what these things are. Uh, How may help? And share. There you go. I hope you can see what I see. Um, That's great. Cool. Great. So I, I get started. And, uh, well, thanks for inviting me uh, once again to your uh, wonderful um, meeting, annual meeting. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. And uh, so the jumping world, jumping worm world, uh, I guess, goes back a bit in, in your organization, because I think in 2012 or something, I, I was talking about jumping worms then. And so the 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 risk that they might pose towards uh, composting uh, when all organic materials is, is supposed to be recycled. So and and um, yeah, now we are we are like a few years later, and uh, we are talking about jumping worms again. And now we have to talk about jumping worms. Uh, why do we care? What are some best mentioned practices and all those things? So I'm going to give a, an introduction to jumping worms. What are they? How do they work? Where they're from? Um, what is of the outlook in terms of controlling them? Uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, first of all, you know, jumping worms, why do we, why do we care? Uh, you know, the, the worm is smiling and the gardener is, is frowning, as you can see there. Uh, and that's, that's basically the picture. Um, I was out in the woods yesterday to count count jumping worm hatchlings, and you'll see how difficult that is once I get to that point and in the presentation where I show you a hatchling. Um, and they are, this year is a good year for them because it's been raining a lot. Uh, they like moisture, they like they like a little heat. Uh, but the rain, the rain by itself, uh, with temperatures above five, about five or ten degrees Celsius will make them hatch. Um, so there's quite a few of them out there right now. You can't see them yet because they're tiny. So the, the worm that you see here is Amynthus agrestis. It's one of the three big uh, big invaders, uh, jumping worm invaders. So jumping worms is a sort of a generic uh, term for all sorts of uh, um, worms out of the megascolescid family. Um, so they're different from from the worms that we're used to, their lumbricity. Uh, not that you should remember that, but just remember these jumping worms are jumping worms. It's not just one species, it's several species. Um, so why do we care? Uh, hang on, I'm on the other screen. There we go. Anyway, so these are the three jumping jumping worm species of concern. Uh, you think that, so one of them is called Metaphy Hilgendorfi. It's on the on the left hand side. It's one. It's the largest one of them. So you find a really large worm that wiggles and and moves like a snake. It's probably this Metaphy Hilgendorfi. Um, then uh, there's Amynthus agrestis, the next larger the next large largest worm, and then Amynthus tokiensis, which is relatively small here in Vermont. Uh, the the most of them you find uh, find in the woods are Amynthus tokiensis. Then Amynthus agrestis, and then about five to ten percent um, Metaphy hilgendorfi. Um, why do we care? Why should we care? So the world is facing a, a bunch of crises, right? I mean, other than uh, people doing stupid things to each other, there's also uh, things that are happening in the world that have to do with um, climate change. So there's mass extinctions that are going on uh, that might be that might be due to climate change, but may also be due to the fact that uh, that we're altering habitat, um, and so there's there's this this extraordinary uh, situation where we're losing a lot of species, but I think some like twenty or thirty percent of species to be lost by the end of the century. Uh, so that's a huge huge problem. Um, there's there's a climate change uh, effect as well by by jumping worms or any kind of earthworm. Uh, they increase climate change gases, um, and uh, you know, all invasive species exacerbate those threats. And there are some invasions that are 
overlooked. Uh, so their earthworm invasions, for example, uh, earthworms have have a, a good street credibility out there or garden credibility, if you want. Earthworms are good, right? So except for when they're in the wrong place. Uh, so in, in areas that were formerly glaciated, so glaciated until about 12,000 years ago, like Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, New York, uh, and then if you go on the other side of the globe, you, you're talking about, you know, uh, places like Siberia, uh, Finland, Sweden, uh, parts of Germany, uh, England, uh, all those places were glaciated relatively recently, up to 12,000 years ago. Well, there were no earthworms there, uh, and so they are now uh, a problem that are, uh, that are a problem planet-wide in some ways. Uh, invasive earthworm research is underfunded, overlooked, and and an under-researched problem. Um, that has picked up a little bit. The research has picked up a little bit over the past 10 years. Uh, but in reality, compared to other, other invasives uh, that, that I worked on, the research field is relatively small. So, you know, uh, biodiversity and climate change are the two big things that we have to worry about. Uh, where are they in the northeast? So you see the white and and white and black dots here on on the map on the left hand side. Uh, so map of the northeastern part of North America, and uh, those those dots are essentially places where uh, they've been where they've been um, found and where they, where a researcher had had gone and uh, basically certified. Yeah, that's that is a a, a jumping one. Uh, there's many more sightings, but we haven't really the researchers involved in this in this field haven't really kind of gone there and and verified that they were actually jumping ones. the the blue the blue circles or the blue blue ovals there uh, represent areas in Canada where they were been found. So until last year, Canada was oblivious. They were naive to these things. They said, oh, we don't have those. We won't get them. And now they have them. So now, now there's many, many sightings. So I think they were there before and people just didn't know what they were looking at. And now, you know, Toronto area, Niagara Falls area, uh, Quebec City, uh, Montreal, and then also into, into New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, there's a ton of these worms that are being seen. Uh, again, not all of those things have been have been verified by uh, people. So just talking about, about this. So there's there's a dark gray area here in on the map on the left hand side, that is how far climate wise they could go. They could go all the way up into Labrador at the moment. Uh, they need a way to get there, but uh, the the situation in Labrador is such climate is Labrador is such that they could survive there. The map on the map on the right hand side shows you a map of uh, uh, Finland, Sweden up here, and then the rest of it is of course Russia um, and uh, and the. So the tundra is, is kind of the tundra. So this, this, the steps of um, or savannas, so steps, yeah, steps of of um, uh, of um, Siberia is, is is right here. So, and this is sort of the extent of the last glaciation. Um, and people are finding earthworms in those in those tundra ecosystems, and they're really they're really high in in the amount of carbon that they store. You don't want earthworms there. But they've made it in there now. So these are not jumping worms. These are just general, normal uh, earthworms from Eurasia that made it there. Um, net effect on soils and the vegetation that these worms have. So now we're talking uh, jumping worms again. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, an ecosystem on camel's hump that, that is, has not been invaded by earthworms. And then below that, there's a, a soil that, that goes with uninvaded um, areas. So that's, that soil here is, has about 10 to 15 centimeters, so four to six inches of a duff layer, which is sort of a, a place that's, that's really spongy. It holds water really well. It's, it's also a place where lots of nutrients are generated that are use, useful for, for plants. Uh, lots of roots are in there, lots of fungi grown there, seed bank of, uh, of many plants, germination medium of many plants, and um, when the jumping worms get into this into these places, you might see a loss of biodiversity, right? Going from here to there. So it's at the Horticultural Research Center, uh, lots of um, this is where we saw about two hundred uh, hatchlings per square meter yesterday. This is the place. Uh, lots of so lots of biodiversity. You can see all these nice little things like hobble bush and and some of the, uh, uh, the ephemerals are gone. Uh, but at the same time, or prior to prior to 
this biodiversity issue, uh, there's another issue that happened prior to that. So this this is the loss of carbon and the loss of this this top horizon of the soil that that spongy um, uh, OE horizon if we call it. Um, so that 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 duff layer that's so important ecologically has been has been reduced to a level to to this sort of thing. So it's no longer the sponge, but it's this this mass of castings that accumulate at the surface of the soil. Um, and in the process of that, uh, you lost a lot of the carbon. So here's that climate change, uh, um, the climate change link. So um, 860 gigatons of, of carbon sequestered in forests worldwide. The northern boreal forests of North America. So you know us up north into into the in the into the taiga uh, of of Canada. Uh, has 20 gigatons of of that 860 gigatons is about 45 percent of that is in the soil and about that's and that is about the same amount that of carbon that we see in the atmosphere so the carbon loss due to earthworms at the moment is to earthworm invasions is about the same as the carbon loss by wildfires or per unit area so that's, that's a huge amount and if if they stretch further and further into into those uh, northern boreal forests there's going to be more loss of carbon. Uh, carbon is, is uh, sorry, forest, forests are also really important for water supply protection. So if, uh, New York City has heavily invested in, uh, in watershed protection uh, around their, their, um, their reservoirs. Uh, and uh, so with jumping worms getting into those, the, the water supply is not as as well protected from pollution so that's another another sort of thing where you think about uh do should we should we just start living with these worms you know because they're here now you know why don't we just acknowledge the fact that they're here uh there are economic reasons why i don't want to do that um at least try and protect some places that are not that are not invaded yet uh so forests are also about 30 percent of land area but 80 percent of all land species live in in forests not necessary in the northern forest but it's just give you an idea uh that's that's huge uh you know so why do we worry about biodiversity it's uh, biomimicry so engineers work with that they they take biological structures and they kind of re reinvent them in the lab and and turn them into aeroplanes or other things by bio, bio uh, pharmaceutics are big and then of course the the, the forest cells or lungs of the earth and that all that is at risk because of uh of invasions not necessarily just just jumping worm invasions but in, invasions in general you know there's plenty of other forest pests so let's have a look at at what these these jumping worms do let's look, let's have a look at, at the life cycle and 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 how to identify these worms so first the the life cycle so what you see on the left hand side is of a a graph of how they develop through the seasons and this is just abundance so the number of number of earthworms that we see per square meter divide that number by 10 and you have you have the number by per square per square foot if you want to do that cal cal calculation um on the x-axis is so the time of year starting sometime in in late late march is the first time i go out there and uh, then it goes all the way to december one that's the last time i go out to look at these worms and uh, what you usually see in, in the springtime is a rapid increase in in hatchlings. Uh, so basically, hatch. So we, so there's, there's this gray area here. That's that's the, that's the time during which you uh, see the first adults appear. So prior to that, everything is is, hat is hatchlings and juveniles. And so you see a, a huge increase in in hatchlings at the beginning of the year, uh, at the beginning of the season. So that means you know first of April on. Um, Sometimes it's delayed, uh, like this year here is delayed, and this year is so delay can happen. But uh, in really good bumper bumper years, uh, you have a fast increase in these in these hatchlings uh, and juveniles up to about mid you know, end end of May mid June, and that's when when you reach the peak. So the the peak season that we had, but was about four years ago, four years ago. Oops. Um, and we had something like 330 uh, earthworms per square meter at that point. Not earthworms, jumping worms. All three, all three species together. This year we had we're a little bit ahead of the curve. So this, these blue, these blue uh, markings here, is, is what we have. What we have now, we're up to about 200 per square meter now. 
uh, at my at my study site um and that's a lot uh, so for for this time of year okay so as as we pass that peak it seems there's always this crash in in their population and that might be that that they might have eaten themselves out of uh out of food um the, which is mainly the leaf litter and and if there's still that duff layer the duff layer is also fair game for them um and uh so that that decline comes just before you start seeing the first adults so as of july 9th or somewhere around 10th you can expect the first adults sometimes they're later sometimes they're earlier depends on the temperature and the moisture of the soil um so it, it, it don't be surprised if you see the first one mid mid august instead of mid mid july uh, and as of that they start producing cocoons um so they have about 120 days of of uh of producing cocoons um and they produce cocoons at a rate of about uh, i don't know a half a cocoon a day roughly each one of them so here you have a so the, for the best year we had or the, the worst year depending how you look at it we had about 260 adults uh so if they if they keep at it um for for the entire for the entire season then that's going to be thousands of cocoons per square meter this is per square meter not not per not per per forest uh so the way this works is the the life cycle is you know the start off as cocoons uh, you can argue with me about cocoon comes first or the earthworm but let's say start just 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 bear with me and let's start with the cocoons so you have the cocoons they go through a, a number of stages uh, it takes about 600 gro growing degree days or that's the somewhere between uh, one month in the summer and uh, about nine months uh, if you uh, from from the end of summer to beginning of may uh, and they go through different stages um, and uh, come on where's my mouse there it is and hatchlings are tend to be relatively big when they when they show up right so this cocoon is probably um, uh, 1.5 to 2 millimeters in size and this thing here is is about two centimeters in length when they hatch so i don't know how they pack in there but they do uh it's really interesting and then it takes it takes them about 90 days to become adults uh, cocoons are survival structures uh remember the 240s one is negative 40 and one is positive 40. negative 40 is is the is the temperature that they can survive to at least at least to negative 40 we we haven't gone any further down and they can also survive to plus 40 but after plus 40 so if that's 100, 105 degrees fahrenheit uh the cocoons die uh it's just too hot they, they just don't make it um uh where do you find them so survivors with cocoons people find them in their in their compost um if you turn your compost frequently and and you expose the entire compost to 105 degrees uh, Fahrenheit then most likely you killed all the cocoons you know and the question is whether that occurs in regular windrow operations um uh static pile might be might be better especially if you can if you can cop if you can cover the the static pile so that even the top of it gets 205 degrees uh and then of course you find lots of cocoons uh, my my postdoc Mariam has uh, went to a couple of nurseries uh, this week, and she's finding cocoons in in the potting mix and in the pots already. So next, uh, that you really need to need to um, do know, uh, so that you don't bother me as much as I as I get bothered about uh, uh, worm identification is how do you identify them? I get a lot of requests at this time of year and say, "Oh, we have got jumping worms. We've got jumping worms." And the good news is that most of the time, I can kind of say, "Well." the pictures you send me and the descriptions you give me uh, basically point to the fact that you don't have jumping worms yet or you at least not what you're showing me they're not jumping worms so knowing your jumping worms from all the other worms might be a really useful uh skill to have and so one thing that I always point to so this is for adults right so we get into the juveniles they're much harder uh I point to that they sort of move like snakes they, they do have this clitellum or this ring around the collar that is re relatively um relatively um flush with the with the rest of the body and it goes all the way around i mean this light band goes all the way around that that body if you see any anything where where the band kind of breaks or the, it, it's not it's not on the underside then you don't have a jumping worm 
um, for uh, for the for for worms that are not jumping worms, usually you have a raised clitellum, and and the the underside uh, is it doesn't go all the way around. So here's here's a here's a worm that has a clitellum right there. So you notice how that is kind of just the same color as as the rest of the worm. So that's not a jumping worm. The other one that that uh, so I'll show you what what an adult jumping worm can do. Um, give me a second. And I might have to. Oh, good! It's in the same screen. Excellent. Uh, bear with me. There's going to be an. There's going to be an ad. Ignore the ad. Or maybe there's not an ad. Oh, good. Here's a jumping worm in somebody's hand, and here's a jumping worm that's on the ground. And so you notice how that kind of snakes around a bit. So the other the other name that we're not supposed to use anymore is is snake worm or crazy snake worm because bad name to. Oh, this is the other picture. See how this that thing is flailing? That's a jumping worm, right? So that's that's how that jumping comes gets into the name. It looks as though it's jumping around. Okay, that's that's the way we can identify uh, these worms by by behavior. So there's one other worm that seems to be doing the same thing. It 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 it's not quite as as vigorously doing it. And when you put put it in your hand, it's not jumping around as 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 quickly. It's not flailing the same way. But it is flailing, and that's that's the um, the red wiggler, right? So your your typical jumping worm. So if you have uh, if you have some red red looking worms in your compost, and you go, oh, I've got jumping worms, and I'm gonna check that, I'll check the wriggling and stuff like that, and it turns out to do that, then it may still not be a jumping worm. And so the way you can tell a red wiggler from a jumping worm is that red wigglers have uh, have these ye these yellow tails. And here's the tail. It looks hopefully a little yellow to you. And the other thing is it has got tiger strikes, stripes. So when it stretches, you see these, these um, yellow stripes in between the segments. And so, uh, so red wigglers are sometimes known as yellow tails or tiger worms. Those are the same species. So uh, if you see that, it's not a jumping worm, it's a red wiggler. And red wigglers are relatively uh, needy in terms of lots and lots of organic matter. So you don't find them in the woodlands as much. Um, so they're probably not as much of a, a scare. So if you buy yourself 100% red wigglers for your your uh, vermicomposting, probably not not so not so bad. The problem is that if you buy them from places you don't know, you might get all sorts of other worms in there. So yeah, you, you have to kind of ask whoever you're buying it from, uh, do you have other worms in there other than red wigglers? Okay, so. How can you tell a jumping worm from other worms when they're juveniles? And so the best way to tell is by this. Come on, do it. That, that behavior. For, for a juvenile, that's telltale for, for these things. And you wonder, you know, when I go out in the woods and I'm looking for, for jumping worms right now, I spent about uh, 30 minutes on, on a half, half meter by half meter plot, so a foot and a half by foot and a half to find worms, especially when it's really, really wet and they're in, in the leaf litter and you have to peel the leaves apart. And I show you a jumping worm. I actually, sorry, pointing at it. So here's, here's a juvenile or a, um, a hatchling, that, that little, little red line. And if you, you have to squint at the screen to see it. And you have to squint at the leaf. Actually, at the leaves, when you see it in, in nature, it, it's it's much more obvious. But it's really they're really small. And once you you've detected one of them, you see them all. The other thing we have to worry about is, of course, introduction and spread. And uh, so there's two words for you: people and water. So people are the big movers of jumping worms uh, and and other earthworms. So that's that is so sort of the transcontinental uh, uh, movement of these worms. So, some come from Asia, so the most jumping worms come from 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 Asia, Northeast Asia. Uh, uh, the worms that most of the worms that we have here in Vermont are actually from Europe, uh, Eurasia. Um, so that people take them and bring them here, not necessarily because they want to, but because that's just the way the trade the trade works and the trade used to work. Um, so a ballast of ship. Uh, of of ships uh, is is the way they came over here the first first place from Europe and then from from Asia we don't know there's a few stories about that uh, the uh, the gift of the gift of uh, uh, cherries from 
uh, cherry trees from Japan might have brought them to the East Coast. But prior to that, uh, there was there were there were jumping worms in California. Uh, they were here in they were found in 1860, so way way before 50 years before uh, the gift of cherry trees. Uh, so that's one way. So, but at, at the smaller scale, with within a continent or within a state. Uh, there's there's trade of materials. Uh, this could be plant materials or earth materials, or even even things like horticultural media, like uh, including compost. Uh, and then transportation on machinery and trucks. So trucks, uh, people have found uh, that uh, that they found a lot of um, colonies of worms, earthworms in in northern Alberta along truck routes. So that's they they move they move with people, they move with trucks, they move with machinery. Uh, they move with trade, but flowing water should not be underestimated. So flowing water is is the other the other biggie. There's actually some worms that can survive salt water, so they can travel for three weeks or something on on a on a bit of wood uh, that that's drifting. Or uh, or in in uh, there's there's been some papers about the Pacific uh, about the Pacific Ocean and and uh, and some earthworms that have traveled around islands between islands, and that was put down to wooden boats in the good old days uh, where they could survive on some of the wood that was in the wooden boats right so and and they they, they traveled that way um but anyway so uh overland flow is one that so if you have a colony at the top of the hill then a big overland flow event so big storm event can can move them downhill um and then also in streams and rivers people have found live worms and live cocoons uh, in in streams and rivers and some actually some of the sightings of North American earthworms uh, have been um, have here in 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 areas where there shouldn't be any earthworms because of the last glaciation have been put down to a movement of cocoons along river corridors. So that's that's the other bit of water thing that you have to worry about. Okay, so now we get into uh, control. Um, I I would like to uh, sort of say that let's be optimistic about that that control can happen, or at least management of these can happen. Um, but you should be aware that there are no pesticides that are currently uh, certified for earthworms, um, not even biopesticides. Um, so there's Boveria bassiana and Metarizium brunium. They're the special fun fungi that, that kill insects, but also earthworms. And they've been, they've been shown to be really good at uh, at killing earthworms, if you feed them, feed feed the earthworms with millet that's been infected by by the fungus. Uh, there is a there's a company um, in Minnesota that's currently working with the EPA for certification of tea tree meal, uh, which is an effective organic uh, chemical against these worms. I'm not sure how far they've gotten. They only started in in March or, or or February with with this process, so I don't know how long it takes. But I will I will contact them and find out where they are with it. So that's coming down the line, and and so the the tea tree uh, meal is is effective. Um, it has been used as a as a fertilizer on um, on golf courses for a long time uh, as a way of fertilizing their grass and inadvertently also killing some earthworms. But it's not certified at all at this point. It can have it can damage. Uh, it can damage uh, aquatic life if, if you apply it close to a, uh, a stream. So we're waiting for EPA certification on this, and that this would be the gold standard of control. Um, and then the other thing we, have, we don't know anything about is, you know, is, are there any effective or safe predators of these worms? So there, there are predators, voles, moles. Um, if, there's even, I even seen a picture of, of a hawk having a, a jumping worm in its, in its mouth. Um, but they're not necessarily the preferred food foods for for some of these animals. What makes our research so long on jumping worm control? What why, what is it? What is it that makes it so slow compared to other kinds of things? It's difficult to keep uh, keep cultures in in the lab. Um, there's only one life cycle per year, so it's really difficult to repeat experiments within a year. You need a lot of repetition. Uh, when you do the experiments, you don't do just one experiment. Maybe you have to have three or four uh, different places where you do it, and that basically makes it more expensive. Uh, and that's that's really where where the crux is the the expense of doing this research. 
uh, and the, the big federal uh, funding agencies have other things that they worry about. So, you know, USDA is worried worried a lot about um, about growing more food for people, uh, which is important. You know, we're we approaching the 10 billion now. It's no longer feeding the 9 billion, it's feeding the 10 billion people by 2050. Um, and uh, and the Forest Service, who should really be worried about, and there are some people in the Forest Service themselves that work on invasive earthworms, but not as their main job. Forest Service is, is worried about um, about forest fires more than about invasive earthworms. So the funding is is sparse, uh, and most of my funding comes from uh, private sources. So the other thing that's really important is that we do research on how to manage the worms themselves, so control and kill them, uh, and how to kill cocoons. The cocoons are really tough to deal with, and that's that's where I think uh, the big challenge lies. Uh, in the future. Okay, that's what I have, and uh, I pass it on to Dan again. Thank you, Joseph. I think, boy, every time every time I hear hear that presentation, I I learn more and uh, continue to get uh, even more depressed about the situation. So, kudos yeah, so, to so the, the big us. thing is the big thing I want to state is that don't be depressed. They're, yeah, they're everywhere. So my my postdoc goes out to many places and looks at looks at gardens and stuff and says, oh, you're to everywhere, you know. Um, don't de be depressed. You know, we have to really learn how how to deal with them in a sane, sane uh, way. And, 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 you know, maybe, you know, in gardens, we may have to start living with them a little bit. Maybe we can reduce their numbers in, in, in various ways. And we can talk about that later when there's questions coming. I'm sure there's going to be questions about control. So don't be depressed. Um, uh, there are people working on it. We have a, a, a working relationship now. We have a, a, a network of people that are going to work together uh, that reaches from, from Nova Scotia all the way to, to Minnesota. And there's about you know, 10 research groups that it will, will put together and, and, and try and find ways of making the situation better. Well, I appreciate it. And I know that um, you've been sounding the alarm for a long time, and I hope people are finally listening and then that we can indeed uh, make some sort of impact. It does seem overwhelming, and I know that a lot of people who are hearing about this or learning about this for the first time do indeed tend to get pretty discouraged pretty quickly. So uh, maybe next time we do it, we should see if we can get better help to sponsor the session or something like so that we can have some backup, because I know it is it is an overwhelming thing. but. Uh, we we are there are things that we can do so maybe let's switch and start talking about that uh, I'm going to just share with you uh, Dan before you do that we just have a clarifying question that we could maybe get in sorry um, so Liz says in her experience red wigglers curl up in a spiral when disturbed versus what we saw in the video of the jumping worm which was more snake like so just for clarify clarification Joseph do the jumping worms curl up like red wigglers too no, I I have not seen that at all. Okay. Um, I've seen them. I've seen them sort of in a in, in a in a curvy sort of shape, but they, I haven't seen them curl up. Uh, uh, okay. it, it, I haven't seen it yet. That's usually occurs when when the earth when the uh, lumbricity, so the other the earthworms from Eurasia, uh, are um, are drying out. So when when there's there's a, there's a drought, they they kind of curl up yeah. and to, to to prevent moisture from moisture loss from their bodies okay great thank you and um just uh just a reminder folks put put any questions or comments into chat um at, at any time and dan i'll pass it back to you now yeah and and, and just recap i'm going to share a little bit about best management practices at compost facilities and we'll hopefully get a chance to talk more about uh, nurseries garden centers and landscapers and as well as at your home if you were watching this and are worried about what you can do at home what steps you can take to be more aware and uh, be a little bit um, precautious about uh, spreading them further beyond where they already are. All right, so I am going to share my screen now. Uh, bear with me one moment and talk to you a little bit about what's happening at the CSWD Organics Recycling Facility. We change our names every three months or so, but that's the current one. Um, it's home of Green Mountain Compost, for those of you who are local and uh, familiar. Uh, so this is this is our site, and we make a lot of compost uh, for Vermont uh, on a Vermont scale. It's a big operation nationally. There are much bigger operations, uh, but we 
we process about uh, between four and 6,000 tons of food waste per year, and we mix that with a lot of yard waste primarily as our carbon source. And that is the culprit for introduction of um, jumping worms and uh, for most compost facilities likely. Um, so um, we will show you real quickly the process. We get food waste is brought in by different uh, haulers. We blend it with um, yard waste and wood chips as uh, that carbon source, as I mentioned. Uh, we use a big machine to do that, one of the many pieces of large equipment that we have on site. Um, and then it goes through an aerated static pile composting uh, process for a couple of weeks at very high temperatures. Um, that is certainly more than enough to kill cocoons and any living worms. Uh, and also reduces any potential human pathogenic um, opportunity that uh, is part of the regulations for all commercial compost facilities. So that's two weeks of high temperatures. We then take it out um, and do an, a second phase of aeration for another three or four weeks before we then uh, bring it down to our curing piles. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. We do turn those piles uh, aggressively. You can see there's a lot of heat still in the piles at that stage. Um, and that they get turned a bunch of times before the final step of screening. That's one of our um, final screeners uh, that takes out basically anything, a large fraction, and, and creates the finer compost that you're familiar with seeing at garden centers uh, or for operations that make bag product. That's generally how they get it to a fine consistency. Uh, and then for at our facility, most of what we produce uh, leaves in this manner through large tractor trailer trucks or large dump trucks before making its way to garden centers um, or landscapers uh, buying it directly for use on big projects. Um, so one of the challenges at our facility is that uh, in addition to these great people in the middle who do a lot of the work uh, and of course all the microbes that do the majority of the work, we also rely on some quite a few pieces of equipment with wheels and uh, metal bodies and uh, they're moving all over the site. Uh, so here's a, these are, we have three front end loaders going around at all times uh, and some other wheeled vehicles as well as the window turner and the screeners. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, and that there, uh, at a site such as ours, um, what often happens is that those loaders will be on one end of the site for a good chunk of the day, and then they'll be up and back and forth. Uh, and so what, our, what we do to limit knowing, now knowing, uh, that there's a good chance that there could be cocoons um, for much of the fall coming in with, with our seasonal influx of, of leaves and yard waste, uh, we, there's no way we've, we don't have any way to screen for cocoons, we take, we take on something like 5,000 tons of yard waste per year. And when you're looking for something the size of a uh, sesame seed, it's, it's even worse than a needle in a haystack, I think. So um, the, what, what we do to combat that is, uh, and this was not designed um, with earthworms or jumping worms in mind, but it's worked out well for us. The layout of our site uh, has some um, great distinctions between receiving areas and active composting areas. So this yellow area here is where we receive our yard waste um, and soon to be wood waste as well. Uh, this is where residential customers and landscapers can come in and drop off material and they drop off, or sorry, then they leave the facility. Um, and everything beyond that is the active and uh, active composting and early stage composting, that aeration that I spoke of is happening either under that roof building or, uh, sorry, uh, or under the opposite side there uh, where we're achieving those high temperatures and constantly being aerated. Uh, at that point, the material is picked up uh, in that big haul truck and driven over this expanse to uh, form our windrows where it is again aggressively turned for um, anywhere between eight and 15 times before its final screening, which happens at this third pad down here, uh, which is where the customers come in and, and pull away a product. So the things that we 
that let us sleep at night uh, in terms of our potential impact at spreading worms um, is that we, at this point, we take it as a given that there are likely cocoons coming in uh, with our leaves and depending on the time of year, potentially some adult worms as well. Um, and that area is surrounded by stone. So that's our first line of defense. We know that uh, while it's possible for worms to travel over things that are not stuff layers and leaves, uh, that their preference is generally for high organic material areas. Um, so they're somewhat contained. This whole area has a large concrete wall around it. You can't see it because it's made that yellow shape there. But um, so there's no easy path or, uh, between that and any other part of the facility. Um, and then we do our hot composting. So of those three loaders that you saw, we have one loader, this one here, that is just stays on this end of the facility. And uh, it has multiple buckets. Um, so most of the loaders that we have um, have a detachable bucket. And so we have one bucket that is dedicated to just handling our yard waste and, and also uh, making the initial blend of materials before it gets aerated. Um, if that loader is needed to move something beyond that process after the uh, high temperatures have been met and we're feeling confident that we've gotten pathogen kill as well as pathogen reduction as well as uh, any cocoon kill, uh, then he switches buckets. And um, so that's, that's our first line of defense there, second line of defense, I should say. Um, and then there are there's a little bit of shared equipment that blue windrow turner you saw does work on both ends of the system. And so whenever we're sharing equipment between different parts of the process, we have a uh, high temperature steam pressurized steam cleaner. So it's like a, like a pressure washer you might get at a hardware store, but ours is super powered and it's up to, I don't know, like 200 degrees Fahrenheit or something. And does a fantastic job of cleaning out the equipment, but also would, um, in addition to removing debris, which could potentially be carrying uh, cocoons, for instance, or actual living um, adults or juveniles, it um, it adds that extra uh, that extra temperature um, component of, of being able to kill something that were were visibly present. Um, and then, lastly, uh, by limiting kind of the highest risk. To one end of our facility, we're, we're, we feel pretty good that the, by the time compost has gotten down to this point, um, again, it's still got it's well over 105 degrees at that point, but it's uh, anything that's happening there is being aggressively turned uh, regularly, and it is, uh, we feel pretty good about our um, distance from the active composting area, and all of this uh, surface is, is stone surface. So, not impossible, certainly, for transmission, uh, un unintentional transmission of cocoons, but those are some of the practices that we put in, in play to uh, make sure that we, we are really limiting uh, that possibility of, of further exacerbating the issue. Because, as Joseph mentioned, compost can be a, a big vector compost, uh, as well as uh, wood product mulches are, are we, we know, um, are a big vector um, in places like Vermont where we have a short growing season and people are um, taking advantage of that good weather to bring on material, import uh, compost, uh, soils, mulches, wood, other wood products, um, as well as all their potted plants and uh, nursery stock. And uh, it's it's just a recipe for easy spread of uh, these jumping worms. So uh, that uh, speaks a little bit to the best management practices for compost based on our own experience and what we've done. Uh, of course, all compost facilities are different. Not everybody has as much land. We have 13 acres or so in production. And it can be very challenging to have physical separation between the different parts of your process. But if at least you are thinking about it, um, as you were making the compost and you and you start segregating your piles, uh, finished product from incoming materials. Uh, and if there's a way to, if not, most people aren't going to have multiple pieces of equipment uh, touching their piles, but even if you have one piece of equipment, 
perhaps you have the means of doing a thorough cleaning uh, of that equipment in between uh, the different stages, you know, from fresh to finished product that can slow the spread. Um, and we, we do have a question for you. Brenda asks if you've done any research to see the impact of your lines of de defense. So um, do you have any insight into like reduction of cocoons and material? We have not, no, we've not done research, but maybe we can talk to Joseph and I know he's got a limited amount of uh, research bandwidth and he's, he's overwhelmed probably with trying to get as much done as he can, but it would be great to know because yeah, we don't, we're not experts on identification. Well, we've not seen, we've not seen any uh, worm. We have seen worms on site, but definitely not uh, jumping worms. And um, so up to this point, not even in the leaves have we seen the adult worms. Cocoon identification, I don't know. They, that would be really interesting because we're getting leaves from all over the county, certainly. And uh, undoubtedly knowing now how widespread these this issue is, there's no no question that we would be getting some quantity of cocoons in the leaves, in my opinion. Um, and we're just one composter in a state with a couple, few dozen composters, and you know, not everybody is able to take these measures and uh, and then there's the garden centers, and that one's uh, a really big one that we should be aware of. So maybe, so no, no to that specific question, um, and hopefully we can have more opportunities to do that sort of research in the future. I want to pause here, be conscientious of time, and make sure that we get plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So I will invite Emily and Joseph to join me on unmuting and um, Maybe, Emily, if you could just speak briefly about what it is you do and maybe what you've seen statewide. Um, how big is this problem in Vermont? Like how, I, I know we've seen in the past that basically every corner of the state has seen identified jumping worms, um, but you go to garden centers, you, you to speak to nurseries. What, how big is the problem or in your mind? Yeah. I think, I mean, it's just such an interesting situation. So plant health at the Agency of Agriculture, we do go out and we look for pests that are of concern and that could be a threat to uh, Vermont's agriculture and environment. Obviously, when this came to the top, we were getting comments and calls from people who were very concerned about the impact of jumping worms um, without realizing that they were so widespread in Vermont. Um, at first, you know, to be totally honest, the team was sitting here and we were at a crossroads looking at, are we going to regulate this pest or is it impossible? We did our research. Uh, we reached out to other states who are also tackling this and we worked with Dr. Gores and we finally came and we actually opened it up for a hot moment. It was like, it was literally a minute we said, okay, why don't, why don't members of the public, uh, you know, send photos in so we can help you identify. And then, you know, we started doing that and then we realized, oh, no, 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 no. Talk about a can of worms. This, you know, we, we're focusing on emerald ash or, or Asian longhorn beetle uh, jumping worms are a problem, but you know, the three of us, uh, that's the number of uh, the people in plant health are not gonna be spending the entire summer in one spot trying to eradicate jumping worm. And so, you know, it's this, it's, 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 um, it's hard because people want, don't want this worm on their property. So automatically they go to, this should be regulated. It's the state's job to make sure this isn't moving. However, at some point from a pragmatic standpoint, it is literally impossible. It's kind of like Japanese knotweed. We get lots of people really upset um, saying the state should be doing something to eradicate this plant. I think anybody who knows that particular plant realizes it's not realistic. Jumping worm is much the same way. So what we've decided to do is kind of go an outreach and education approach um, and increase the public's awareness around it uh, so they can protect their property and then also engage with nurseries. And we are definitely seeing uh, worms uh, moving in the nursery trade and just reaching out to um, nursery owners, managers, and explaining the issues associated with this. Um, and we have created a, a BMP list uh, for nurseries specifically 
uh, working with the nursery industry as well as Dr. Gores um, in an effort to say, hey, you know, there is something that you can do. We may not be stop selling everything, but as the public's education and awareness grows, this really could impact your bottom line because people don't want to be bringing this home. Nurseries, it would behoove you to take these practices seriously because people are going to be looking for these things. And if they see it in your nursery stock, your sales are going to be impacted. So, you know, just going from awareness around that too, to make people care. Um, but to answer your question, we are definitely seeing it all over. Um, and it's just literally impossible to um, regulate. If we regulated just nurseries, um, you know, we would have to regulate composters. We have to regulate the movement of the pest. It's literally impossible. But um, this kind of stuff um, and then leaning in and learning from composters and the folks who are actually doing on the ground research and um, activities around um, control, learning from everybody and then maybe using the state as a megaphone to for outreach and education um, to spread the word. So it's a big problem and we recognize it. We won't minimize it, um, but there's our hands are tied. So it's got to be a really massive collective effort. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think awareness is going to be the biggest part of that because I don't know about all of you, you know, we've been aware of it for a decade and whenever Joseph first brought it to our attention at the uh, board session long ago, uh, but it didn't seem like much of an issue. And now I think we've seen a lot of media coverage in the last two, three years, particularly. And again, seasonal when people start getting outside is when it tends to happen. Uh, but it's been going on a long time. And it seems like um, at this point, I would agree based on what I've heard that it's the horses out of the out of the barn, that there is no stopping jumping worms in Vermont. And it's probably a matter of time before they're in our forest, not just in plots of South Burlington, but maybe in, at Campbell's Hump and, and, and we will have to get to know how to uh, live with these uh, worms as part of our ecosystems. Um, and, that's, and that's a tough one to swallow. I'm wondering, Joseph, uh, what's the experience in other places, like maybe perhaps the Midwest where they've been aware of this perhaps longer or it's more, I mean, how do how do how does Vermont compare with other parts of the country in terms of how bad the situation is, how widespread it is, and what what the implications are long term? Well, I, I for first of all, I, I think uh, the implication the implications are bigger than what what we realize. So, so I I I agree with you that the horses are the barn, but I don't agree with you that the horse couldn't be put back in the barn. Right. So and I think that's what we have to work towards, because biodiversity and, and climate change are big issues. And these these worms are definitely um, adding to the problem, the, these two problems. Uh, so uh, I think the main thing is and I get get to the experience of other states in a second. But the main thing is uh, prevention. Right. So prevention is better than than the treatment. So we have to be careful about where we put things so if if you're in the middle of of a city you know you're, you're maybe in where i live in st albans uh, uh in a sub sort of a suburban type thing i have jumping worms i'm not too worried about it because uh the woodlands are far away and uh i make sure that that when i go to the woodlands to do to work i i have clean shoes on right so that's that's one thing so there's areas maybe we can say well risk zone zero right because yeah you have the worms but if you're careful, you're not going to spread them. Then the risk zone two would be, you know, would be maybe a little closer. Maybe it's it's a uh, it, it's an, a, a, a development that's put in the middle of the woods, right? And and then you and and, and worse if it was put really close to a, um, a a sugar bush, an operating sugar bush. Then then you you're talking about somebody's livelihood. Right? You're talking about a sugar bush being uh, affected uh, and the the number of saplings going down and maybe maybe you're not you're not going to be a sugar bush for longer than another, than, than another hundred years you know then we're talking long long term outlook uh, where where what's going to happen to our sugar bush you know what's 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 happened to regeneration and then you have to kind of on on that on that uh, you know second level of of risk you you need to maybe say well 
there's a certain things certain things you can and cannot do in, in, on your land or i mean again we can't regulate that but we we can we can say hey you know there are some things you can do you can have a very nice garden if you do this this and this and so the outreach is important what is the experience of other states um pretty much the same experience as in as in vermont uh i like to pick out uh, wisconsin as uh probably the first state that had had regulations around jumping worms uh, they regulated i think 2007 or 2006 uh and they made them um they made them invasive and uh, unwanted species or something like that and that basically meant uh, that a nursery that was found found to have these worms could be quarantined and then in in 2000 sometime in, in the in the early 2000 in, in early teens of the, of of this century uh they kind of step back from that because they realized that a lot of nurseries had them and if they started started actually applying the law um the natural resource law as it was then then they would have to shut down a ton of nurseries which again is is a of course then there's there's an outcry about uh, the economics of that uh, you know you you put in a lot of business out of out of business and and that's that's not uh, a fair thing to do so they we they reduced the threat level and now uh they have to follow follow some um best management practices uh best horticultural practices to uh um to show that they're they're willing to control these worms uh and those i would say that some of those things are just not sufficient uh as best mentioned practices i mean sure there's all that all the things that we do for invasive species generally but we're talking about plant species mainly um so yeah uh, so that i think everybody in in the northern tier of the of the us and now in canada are starting to think about what are the best management practices that we need to have uh and what is even more important i think that's something that uh, emily and i were bouncing around a bit is yeah we can come up with best management practices but where's the science to back them up right so uh where is that science that says if you do this you can be assured that 95 percent of the cases you don't have these worms you're not going to get these worms so the science the science is is not entirely there i mean we do a lot of science but you know some of the science has to be uh at the nurseries themselves and you know there's not many people that step out and say can we do the science and then of course once you increase the number of nurses you're working with you also have to start increasing the amount of money you're throwing at it uh, and there's just not enough money to do this kind of research so this sounds like do, uh, uh, doom and, and gloom uh, but i would say i have a lot of hope in that the research can be done uh we are we, we're trying to raise money other than through through grants so, and we're hoping that that eventually will will work out um so other states are in the same in the same boat there's a, a particular there's the university of minnesota uh, arboretum um that is is at the forefront of of some of this research uh of the control research uh, we're collaborating with them now for the summer and they're they're trying they're going to try out a ton of different agents uh for for controlling these worms including non-organic um they have they feel that they have a responsibility because they have their own sales area so they're they're acting as a nursery as well as an arboretum and they have their their place is overrun with these worms so they want they they themselves just from from their own conscience their university outfit right they're saying well we can't possibly uh sell all this stuff to people and and tell them it's okay you know so they are working really hard at, at it so the takeaway from from this is there's hope and and uh maybe maybe if we can't get the whole horse in we can get the tail into the barn you know i don't know great um, um we, sorry we do have a question um from chat uh rhonda says uh not specifically jumping worm related but um but she's going to comb through the vermicompost uh, for cocoons before adding it to the garden to mitigate any possible spread of another exotic earthworm species. Like, is that a concern or do red wigglers not pose a threat to native forest ecosystems? Like how, so for our vermicomposters out there, if they're sure that they're using the right species to for vermicomposting, like what other guidance or do you think that they should be concerned about? 
I wouldn't be too concerned about red wigglers. Uh, they're not as then then they they, they they need a lot of organic matter. That's why they're good composting worms. Uh, and uh, I have not seen them in many places in the woods at all. Mm -hmm. And if they were there, then there was one or two, not a million of them. So they they just the the, the amount of of organic matter that's in the woodlands uh, is a lot less than what you find in um, in in a compost pile. So I I would not worry about red wigglers at all. Great, um, thank you. What I worry I worry about that that you buy the red wigglers from somewhere, you know, uh, where they most of most of the, the the vermiculture is done in open pits. So how do you produce red wigglers? Open pits, so they can these pits can be in, invaded or uh, worm beds or whatever you want to call them. Um, they can be invaded, and if you are somewhere in uh, in um, uh, Pennsylvania, it's warm enough for there to be a lot of a lot of jumping worms and you probably get a few jumping worms in your in your shipment of uh, um, of red wigglers so you need to know who you're working with and i always tell this story about um, going to university of connecticut for worm day so vermicomposting day uh, and i give talks about jumping worms and, and composter worms and um and the lady don uh Penelli, uh always buys uh, buys bags of red wigglers so that she can hand those out and people can start their own things so one year uh i go down there and and i look at the back and said you know those are not red wigglers so uh, malaysian blue worms uh and said what but they told me they were red wigglers and and she bought it from from a vermicomposting outfit uh that's national actually um and uh it were 100 percent 100 uh, percent malaysian blue worms and uh, so they they don't survive really well in our woodlands because they need it a little bit warmer but if the climate warms up a bit more then maybe they can make it too uh but it just goes to show that that they're real hacks in that business that that tried you know, like anybody else that tried to sell their product and and if, if it's not red wigglers today they'll be red wigglers tomorrow right <laughs> um mm -hmm. so you have to be careful Ideally, you want to know who you're buying them from, and you should really uh, talk to them before you place the order. So most of the most of the sales are online. Yeah. So buying worms directly, you take caution. I think buying plants is another one that I, I don't know if people realize the probably like the high probability of potted plants that have been not necessarily even just from Vermont, but the fact that the nursery trade exists over multi-states generally, and a lot of uh, potted plants come from other places, there's a, a real good chance of, if those places have jumping worms, which again is much of the country at this point, or, or a good portion of the country where these plants might come from, uh, that there's a good probability that the potted plant that they're importing into their garden, uh, as many, many Vermonters do, um, that they could be uh, have cocoons with them, or even adults, depending on the time of year. We've heard of stories of bald and burlap trees. Of those of you uh, aware of how how trees and shrubs are um, sold in nurseries, those are a perfect environment for for these uh, species. And we've just heard horror stories of of just explosions of jumping worms when they're um, unburlapped uh, for. For sale, and so things like some of the best management practices for reducing this is not to buy potted plants, which doesn't seem practical, you know, for how we do gardening in this in in Vermont and New England and much of the country. Uh, uh, not to do plant exchanges, like a lot of neighborhoods might get together with their neighbors and say, "Hey, I've got some extra of these perennials. You take them, and I'll take those." It's a you know a beautiful thing, except it's a, probably a really good way for to uh, spread uh, some of the worms. Um, so there are, it, it, I struggle personally with trying to figure out what the solution is, knowing that gardening is something we wanna celebrate and encourage. Same with composting, uh, you know, people trying to do the right thing, do and, and, and doing this important thing in Vermont where, we, where our enjoyment of good weather is limited, we wanna make the most of it. How to best do that? And one of the ways, uh, to find out more of these BMPs, Natasha, maybe I wonder mm -hmm. if this is an appropriate time where you could tell us what's going on with CAV. 
sure. um, in terms of helping to spread the information. Yep. Um, we did have a couple questions in chat. You want me to pull that up first, or do you want to, um, maybe you can read some of those while I'm sharing my yeah. screen? Yeah. Why don't you share with us, and then we'll jump okay. back to your questions. I just want to okay. make sure we don't run out of time. Sure. Um, can you guys see that? All right. So one of the things that we've been working on with the Composting Association of Vermont, with a lot of help from um, from Dan's team, actually, because he's really been, he's the one who who sort of asked for some of this is, you know, we started thinking about, because there are some, some literature, some education that's been circulating that is sort of like, you know, don't buy compost. And it's like, compost could be a potential problem, but there, even if it's a, a, a jumping worm free compost to start with, if it's going to different nurseries or garden centers or landscapers, there's multiple places along the, the chain where jumping worms could be introduced. So really just trying to broaden the education and what's a, the information that's available to sort of like this whole spectrum. Because really, if we're going to, as Joseph said, try to get this the, the horse's tail back in the barn, um, we need to be thinking about all of these potential points of introduction. And so um, while this is just sort of a, a, a preamble here, down here is perhaps a, the more interesting part. So we started thinking, how do we help um, residents and just people who are learning about this understand what is, um, you know, what questions to even ask? And so we came up with some questions for compost facilities to ask them, um, landscapers, garden centers. And then we also went through and pulled together some best practices for compost facilities, also for home and community compost scale. Um, and for landscapers and 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 garden centers. And so these, as Joseph said, you know, and and as also was sort of brought up a little bit when Brenda asked um, Dan, like, do you have research showing that this works? Well, this isn't, you know, we can't say that the these best practices that we're promoting are one hundred percent, you know, guaranteed or um, you know, or there's research proving some of these, but it is based on the science and, and extrapolating from what we do know um, about spread, about life cycle, about when to, um, you know, some of the things that can be done to intervene. So for example, for home and community composting, you know, you can make your own compost and keep them. I often talk with community composters and home composters about like, if you don't have them, what can you do to not get them? And if you have, if you know you have jumping worms on your property, what can you do to not share them, right? So there's a responsibility in both directions. And so you can make your own compost. You can, uh, if you're buying compost, you can ask them the questions like, do you know jumping worms are a problem? Are you even thinking about this? I think like raising the awareness is, is and getting people talking about it is a really important first step. We do know about some of the, the, heat sensitivity that the Dr. Gore has shared with us. So um, solarizing is one thing that you can do. And maybe Joseph can talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute, because um, it's a little bit different than like what gardeners might be used to in terms of solarizing, like just to kill weeds. You really need to like wrap the material up. But also a lot of the things that Dan mentioned, washing roots of plants before you buy them or before you share them, you know, making sure that it's a bare root exchange, you know, is one of the things we promote or sharing seed or cuttings that you can be sure are not, you know, are less likely to be vectors and spread jumping worm. And so again, these are based on, um, uh, you know, on the best information that we have now. And we hope that this page will also be evolving. So as we learn more, as Joseph continues his research, as more people get involved, we'll be adding to this either resources or maybe, you know, some of the things that Joseph mentioned might be, you know, become certified practices or, or um, things that you can add to kill the jumping worms we'll be linking out to that information as more information becomes available. But we were hoping that this would be a good uh, resource for people to start the conversation. 
and have some idea of not only what to ask, but like if you ask your landscaper something and they're like, never heard of them. Oh, that's not a problem in our area. You know, like, like we can start educating from both directions, right? So we want folks engaged in this whole process <clears throat> to have an increased awareness. Um, Thank you for sharing that, Natasha. Yeah, we had a really good chance. I did put the link in the comments there. If yes. folks want to spend a little bit more time digging into that and seeing what's available, there's some great links on there for best management practices for other parts of the country as well, uh, where they've uh, been thinking about this a lot. And we'll also add the recording um, in the VORA section, but I'll, I'll be putting um, the recording of some of this content from today and also from um, what Emily shared last year on this page as well, so that it'll, it'll be an evolving, evolving page. So there are a couple more questions that came in. And Dan, asked. can I can I quickly address something that Natasha was talking about earlier? Um, so solarization uh, sure works. One of the things when you solarize bags, and this comes comes from the community. There's like three people that have have told me about this. When you solarize bags, try not to solarize the bags directly on the soil. Um, because the bottom of that that bag will then adjust to the temperature of what the soil is, and um, and it it may not heat up enough to kill the worms. So even when you when you turn it over after after two days or a day of of solarization, then the worm kind of moves the other direction. The worms move. Worms worms go go with where the climate is right. So uh, kind of try and raise those things up a little bit from this from the soil. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that um, that's and and Joseph, please correct me if if I'm wrong on this, but my understanding as well is like so the solarization, you know, certainly cocoons that can't get up and move um, are you know solarizing is more effective on, but I think that I read that it also for juveniles are less mobile than the adult worms, um, and so the timing of some of these interventions may also increase or decrease the efficacy. Is that? Sure. Would, okay. Yeah, so you basically want to uh, solarize when when the worms haven't, uh, ideally when they haven't hatched, but you know, that mm -hmm. beginning of April, who thinks about their garden at that point, or even thinking about compost, but uh, but even in intermit, intermittent May, I think solarizing uh, compost will be effective. Mm -hmm. After that, mm -hmm. the worms get bigger, they can move around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I yeah. would solarize when when the worms are not there yet. I when they when they're still cocoons. So that's that's the best time. April is not a good time to solarize. It's the, the day length is too short and the sun mm -hmm. is, is too low on the horizon. But so mid May, I think that's when you can start. But the steaming, I've worked with some farmers who are actually renting like the steam steamer, sort of things, yeah, yeah, and they're they're steaming um, March April like in their greenhouse in their high tunnels to try yeah, to. That, address all of that because that can be done in you know certainly march april time frame absolutely so mm -hmm. uh the um i think middlebury middlebury or rutland extension i think has has uh, a steamer salt steamer available mm -hmm. but it's really not worth doing unless you unless you have uh, a greenhouse that you want to i mean as a farmer you don't want you can't do an entire field it will take too long Right. So more for like the high tunnels or greenhouse high tunnels, areas. Greenhouses, yeah. Yeah. That kind yeah. Of stuff. And then, of course, you're burning tanks of diesel. True. So there's a maybe a trade off there. But that's, you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a, not done as often. So. All right. So let's um, some of the questions I do want to get to in the chat. Um, one is, would you recommend screening any online red wriggle, wiggler purchases for jumping worms before putting them in vermicompost systems? Uh, super difficult, right? So I mean, you you get you get thousands of worms in a in a in, in a couple of pounds of. Uh, so, I would say it's it's worth doing if they were all adults, because then you could pick them out really really easily. But if they're if they're little and you want to look at two thousand worms in your couple of pounds of of red wigglers, um, then I think you you'll get bored after a while. <laughs> It'll take you a long time. Uh, you can do it, but uh, but I don't have a worm screening party as part of your educating your your community, right? Got yeah, a bunch of people over. Look and, at the look at the uh, identification keys and 
yeah and and it's it's quite amazing there's quite a few communities that are really interested in doing something about these jumping worms i just talked to uh uh i think it was co the the um conservation commission of um of i think it was jericho right or, or, or underhill uh, uh penny can he came down here to talk to me about about this and and there's a lot of interest in in getting getting stuff done so i mean if we could put together a few workshops where we show some of these these things that Dan was talking about, like you know bare root exchanges and and that kind of stuff, or uh, Natasha, you talked about it mm -hmm. as well, um, then that that may actually be a really cool thing. And I I don't see why you wouldn't be able to have a root washing station at a at a nursery. You know, if you mm -hmm. if you really want to take something back that is that is not. I mean, and if a nursery had to do that themselves, they'll add a lot of cost. But if individuals wanted to do that, it may not be such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just then trying to convince the nursery that need, that it needs to be done. Sure. Um, the other thing I think I think that that uh, just going back to what to a dance presentation about um, about composting, uh, his composting facility. Uh, uh, maybe shoe brush stations might be a good good idea when you go from one area that's contaminated to an area that's not contaminated or if you um if you have a garden and uh and there's some areas that are not contaminated you know clean your shoes before you move to the next area if you have a, especially if you have a large a large property uh, and you have a few woodlands in the back or you have uh you have a sugar bush uh, nearby you know clean your shoes before you go into the sugar bush yeah, that's a good good thing to point out. That's what part of the landscape for BMPs as well is like not only cleaning your shovels and your wheelbarrows and your truck in between properties where you might be taking a bunch of vegetative matter from one place to another, but also cleaning your shoes. And that I would guess if we were to survey landscapers uh, in Vermont or anywhere, that if any of them knew that that was what they should be doing, that I'm guessing we would get a low response. Um, so. We need to do the education and, and then there's also the practicality of expecting everybody to do it uh even if we tell them that they're, they're aware that it's the right thing to do um right uh there was a question uh from rhonda about what the risk is to farmers in backyard food gardens which is a good we talked we know it's really bad when they get to a forest but what about what happens when they're in a garden, compost i'm uh, sorry in a uh, garden say. um so the the main the main um symptoms in plants that are affected by by the soil structure changes that that jumping worms produce um so going from from a regular firm soil to this this very loose casting soil is is a drought symptoms right so drought symptoms uh so water is not taken up uh, very easily and so you can once you once you say talk about water not being taken up by the plants uh you're also talking about that uh, nutrients are not being taken up by the plants, right? Because uh, plants take up nutrients uh, that are dissolved in in soil water. Um, so that that's the main thing that that have been has been seen. Some people have talked about rot, rotten roots that might that might come with exposure of the roots to to uh, more oxygen. Um, we had an experiment here where we transplanted. Uh, um, little plugs of of um, uh, cilantro plants into different different kinds of soils so, or, or you know actually potting mixes so one potting mix was just potting mix as as was uh, as we bought it then another potting mix had had the jumping worms in it for two weeks before we transplanted the the plugs and another one we transplanted the potting mix and added the worms at the same time and so the the plants that were added to the to the uh, potting mix where the, the the earthworms had been present for two weeks uh, didn't make it they all withered away 100 percent um when you transplant into a soil uh, that didn't have them in so that that not normal potting soil vigorous plants and then the, the middle thing where you added the the worms together with the with the with the the plants um there was mixed results it was like your 50 percent died 50 percent were doing okay um so what we took from that is that um 
first of all, you know, if you plant something directly into into the uh, the casting layer, uh, the plants are probably having a hard time. This is just cilantro, right? So there's only one plant. Uh, and plants are different. But we also think that if you had bigger plants to transplant and you transplant them into the garden, um, below below that casting layer, then maybe you have you have better luck. That's number one. Number two for this is it's if it's the casting layer that that causes the disconnect between the the plant root and the soil, so they can't take up any water or any nutrients. Then why don't you mix the, the the castings into the soil itself? So you homogenize that soil so that the castings are just one part of the soil. And then that might that might help you uh, with 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 a more successful successful garden. Um, that's just an idea. Have I proven that? I only know from what from what we did with the cilantro plants that those castings are a problem. So if you get rid of the, the castings and don't remove them but mix them in. And I always think that uh, tillage tillage is if and I know a lot of you want to be no-till type people, but a little bit of tillage may not be such a bad idea because if you go to uh, places, for example, in the uh, in the intervale uh, where they have seed beds, uh, where they prepare, prepare seed beds, the seed beds themselves don't have a lot of earthworms in them, whereas areas next next to the seed beds do have them. So. Uh, it may be that a little bit of tillage goes a long way in terms of uh, discouraging these worms. Mm -hmm. Particularly is... given uh, during when when the worms are emerging at the time of the year when tilling is most likely to occur for most home gardeners anyway. That I, I think uh, I remember hearing you talk in a previous presentation that that might be an effective way to really reduce the amount of probability that they will become an infestation in your home garden. For sure. Uh, so try that out. I'd, I'd be interested in how, how that works for you. I also remember one other thing that, that was really cool. Uh, Irene wasn't cool, right? So we know that. But there was a cool thing going on with Irene uh, at a at a site uh, on the Creechy River. It was a, it's a floodplain that was inf heavily infested, like hundreds of uh, hundreds of jumping worms per square meter before Irene. And then Irene dumped about a foot of uh, silt on that floodplain. And then the following five years, we didn't see any of those worms there at all. So tillage, when you turn the soil, you might actually move the move the the cocoons uh, deeper and in, deeper into the soil, and they may not they may not if they hatch, they may not be able to get to the surface. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Interesting. So I do. Um, oh, go ahead, Dan. Go ahead. Now I was just going to say, there's a lot of other questions. There, there are a lot of other questions, and unfortunately, I think we're going to be running out of time here. But what I will say is that um, we've been talking about adding a frequently asked questions section to that web page. And so I can um, I'll collate all these questions that we didn't get to. Some of them are fabulous. And I will um, touch base with my colleagues here to make sure that we have the right answers and then add them, you know, along with the reporting you know, to that web page. And um, I'd like to just thank all of the participants for joining us today and sharing your expertise and, and what the state is doing and Dan, what you're trying to do and really spearhead some best practices and raise awareness among composters and among our community as a whole. And thanks to all of the participants. Thank you all. Pleasure. Thank thanks you for everybody. coming. Yeah, thank you everybody. Have a wonderful weekend.